Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday evening Bible study, the Apostolic Faith Church. Good to be with all of you here this evening. We'll talk a little slower for just a moment to give everybody a chance to log on. Uh, make sure that we're all together in one accord, in one mind, and in one place. Not necessarily in one physical place, but in one spiritual place. Amen. And speaking of which, this Sunday is going to be the last time that we're going to be in a digital format. And that the Sunday following, we're going to be back in the building. Amen. In the house. We're all going to be here uh, on February 7th. I, I'll just give everybody a chance to shout and praise God for that in your homes right now. Because we're excited about what God's doing. We're excited about the church Coming back in full force, back together, back in the building. I'm just excited about what God is going to be doing this year. Uh, I'm, I really pray, I hope that uh, things are going well, that you've got something out of this second time back in your homes and through this digital format that the Lord's been working with you in your spirit and in your homes. Um, I feel like we're stronger together right now. I feel like we're stronger and in a stronger place than we've We've been in a long time with the Lord. I believe the Lord has given us favor, and I'm so th so thankful and so grateful for what God is doing. I did just want to share a scripture with you here as we start this evening. In Proverbs chapter 16, uh, it says, The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord... Weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Every one that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. I want to focus on this tonight. When uh, a man's eye, or when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. I just this stood out to me this evening because I know there's a lot going on. I feel like there's a lot against us right now. I, it might feel like we have a lot of enemies maybe right now. But whenever our ways please the Lord, if all if all we do is just focus on pleasing the Lord, if all we do is focus on what the Lord is speaking to this church, if all we do is spend our time in prayer and spend our time in focus and giving glory and honor to the name of Jesus, everything will go the way it needs to go. Everything will go as it should. The wicked can't prosper against the people of the Lord when we're united together to do His purpose. Whenever we've dedicated in our heart to be pleasing unto the Lord, nothing will prosper against us. The Lord has made us strong together. I'm so thankful to be a part of this church. I'm so thankful to know that the Lord has his favor upon us. I'm so thankful to be grounded upon the name of Jesus. I'm so thankful to be in a place where the Holy Ghost can move freely. Are you thankful for that tonight, church? If you could where you are, if you're able to where you are tonight, could we just stand up to our feet and lift our voices and clap our hands and give glory to the name of Jesus tonight. Why don't we give glory to his name? We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for to be a part of this church. We thank you, Jesus, to be a part of the fulfillment of prophecy of the last days. We thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. I just want to mention real quickly in the way of announcements, we're going to get uh, have, have just a word of prayer for a couple of needs here, and then we're going to dig into the word of the Lord. But again, uh, for those of you that didn't catch it in the beginning, we are coming back in the house in February 7th. It's going to be our first time back uh, in, the, in the building, in the actual physical format. Uh, we do have one more week this, this Sunday. It's going to be our digital format and then Wednesday as well. But Sunday we're going to be back in the building. Wednesday is going to be our annual business meeting. That's February 10th, not this today. So don't 
Don't freak out. But on February 10th is going to be our business meeting following the first Sunday back in the building. Uh, we do want to remember to continue our time of prayer at 7 p.m., uh, especially on Tuesday and throughout the week as much as you can, um, just so that we can bind together in prayer during those times. Uh, again, reminder, our, our website, appstockfaith.com, does have the, the YouTube channel link, the opportunity for online giving to be able to give in that virtual format in the offering. And don't worry, in just a little bit of time, this will be back and you can put it in the basket. Uh, but for the time being, if you're biting at the bit and you don't know what to do with all the stockpiled tithes and offering that you have, you can give online. And it's at the website, apostolicfaith.com. Let's all say it together. Apostolicfaith.com. Amen. Uh, just real quickly, prayer requests we do want to mention. Uh, obviously, our pastor and his wife are still recovering from, from COVID and crash. And they're, they're still a little bit sore and healing, so uh, continue to pray for them. And everybody else that is kind of sick and going through this, we still have cases of COVID going in different areas all over and uh, other sicknesses as well. So we do just want to keep everybody in prayer that's going through that. And it, I'm just praying that the Lord puts a stop to it in the house of the Lord, that he puts a stop to it among his people. Amen. I've just been really feeling uh, that that separation between Egypt and Goshen. I just, I've been feeling that, that the Lord is going to put a stop to these things and the, the rest of the world might have their issues, but I believe that the church is going to rise up as a testimony even during this time. So if you can believe with me and pray with me in that way as we pray for these needs, I do want to continue to remember uh, Ward Phillips' mother still recur uh, recovering from uh, brain surgery, uh, so keep her in your prayers. We do want to mention all of our health care workers and everybody that's uh, been pushed kind of to their limits during all this time uh, and the crisis going on that we can just pray and, and let the Lord work in those things. Whenever, whenever people are going through a crisis like this, they, they are looking for, you know, what, what's the answer to all this? Why is all this happening? And, and it's in moments like that when people truly reach out that they can see a witness and see a testimony. So let's just pray that... Uh, all these things that are happening can provide more opportunities to witness to even our healthcare workers or to people in these needs in the hospital. So, can we just go to the Lord in prayer tonight and ask that He would be upon these needs, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the the promises, you, the blessings that you've given us, Lord, and the the boldness that we have in this time to be able to stand up and know that we have confidence in the name of Jesus Christ. I ask, Lord God, that you would continue to to bring healing to those that are in need tonight. I ask that you would continue to bring healing. Uh, and recovery to, to Lord Philip's mother who's recovering from this surgery. Lord, I ask that you would continue to heal our pastor and his wife, that you would continue to heal their bodies and give them strength and make them whole. Lord God, I ask that you would bring healing to the church, that you would put a division between the church and the world, that you would bring us through this, Lord, that you would bring a healing virtue amid, among the church, that we could rise up and be a witness and be uh, a light on a hill that could shine forth the name of Jesus through a testimony and through a healing, Lord God. I ask, Lord, that you would bless your people tonight, Lord, that you would bind us together through the Spirit of the Lord and through Hallelujah. truth, through the blood of the Lamb, that you would anoint your people, that you would raise us up together, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask Hallelujah. it, we believe it, we claim it in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. God bless you all. We're going to hear from the word of the Lord tonight. Don't go away. The pastor's coming. Amen. And the pastor is here. <laughs> God bless you, everybody. Well, thank you for your prayers and support. Um, I do want to say that my wife and I are, are doing relatively well um, in spite of some of the recent events and things that we've been through, uh, but we certainly appreciate your prayers and your support and uh, reaching out with uh, your thoughts and, and uh, cards and, and uh, just, just, the, uh, just the unity of the fellowship here and, uh, and your support of us. 
Uh, we do thank you for uh, being with us on, on Sunday, joining us. Thankful for our ministry team here and the outstanding preaching man, Brother Frankfurt. Just he's just burning the house down uh, with some of this preaching, and I appreciate uh, his leadership here. And uh, Brother Josh, Brother Juwan, their preaching and, and support and ministry, um, keeping things rolling uh, behind the scenes. A lot of work that's going on. Appreciate the men that came in Saturday and did some updates on the building. Uh, we're hoping to get a couple more things done um, before we come back, and uh, we're excited about that. Uh, we are excited about coming in to the building and, and for our uh, in-person services. Uh, we are hoping to have, uh, have our live stream continue for the preaching uh, for those who are not able to be with us. And just a quick reminder as we look forward to that, um, if you are not feeling well, you have fever, you have any COVID-like symptoms, uh, please stay home. I, again, I said it's a unique thing in my uh, years of ministry. I don't know that I've ever heard it, nor have I said it myself but so strongly, but if you're not feeling well, stay home. Right. Normally we say, bless God, you need to come to the house of God and get prayed for, uh, and, and we do feel that way. But it, it, remember, it's not just us that we're thinking of, we're thinking about other people. Uh, we're thinking about guests who may come, and uh, we certainly don't want to be offensive in that manner. So I hope you can appreciate that, our stand and our position on that. Uh, we will be trying to monitor that, but uh, the best thing to do is if you are exposed to anybody with COVID, uh, if you are sick or having symptoms, the best thing to do is just give us a call, tell us what's happening, uh, we'll pray for you. We need to be wise. We've all kind of taken turns uh, with uh, quarantines and, and sicknesses, uh, it's a real thing, and, and we do want to continue to pray for those who've been affected by uh, coronavirus, and for all of our healthcare workers, uh, everybody involved in, in that light too. And I didn't get this message out when we prayed, but I do want you to keep in prayer uh, the Long family. Uh, uh, Sister Barb's stepmother passed away recently. Uh, she recently had surgery as well, so we want to continue to pray for the Long family. And uh, I'm sure we'll be able to uh, uh, connect with people a little bit better when we get back in the building. And I'm excited about that. Uh, let's continue to pray for new families we've been working with and Bible studies that are going on. Uh, and uh, let's look forward to, uh, to uh, can reconnecting and uh, just allowing the Lord to do a great work in our lives. Amen? Amen. And we just had a great time, my wife and I, just a few days to get away. We had some, uh, it was our 35th wedding anniversary. Uh, so 35 years. I've, I've told people throughout the years that I, I, I knew my wife for 10 years before we got married. It took me 10 years to convince her to marry me. I spent the last 35 now convincing her, trying to convince her that it was a good idea. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure if I've done that or not, but, uh, but we're still together. That's a good thing. So, yeah, exactly. um, but, um, but I do thank you for your uh, thoughts and, uh, and your kindness. Uh, we, had a, we had some bigger plans uh, that were kind of foiled by the uh, nefarious forces at work uh, and the sinister uh, goings on behind the scenes. But uh, nevertheless, we did have a couple days to just get away for a little bit of a respite, and uh, we thank you for that. And thank you for everybody who was there to pitch in and keep things rolling. And uh, we, we are really excited. I know there's a lot of things going on in our world. Um, but listen, uh, the most important thing is that we're reaching souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Um, in fact, let me say this tonight. When Jesus called disciples, when Jesus called disciples, and that's what we're considered to be. In fact, right. Jesus said, if any man wants to be a disciple. Right. Which kind of gave the implication, didn't it, that there could have been more than 12. Sure. I know the 12 was the number of the tribes and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, but it, it appeared as though, even that rich man that Jesus appealed to, he said, if you want to... If you want to come and follow me, you just sell all you have and give it to the poor and, and, and come on. Right. And uh, he couldn't do it. Um, so Jesus made an open and active invitation many times for more disciples. And, and I'll tell you what the church needs today. The church needs more disciples. Sure. People who have uh, committed themselves to the truth, have committed themselves to the kingdom of God, who have allowed themselves to be discipled. You can't be a disciple unless you have been discipled. Uh, right. If you've been, and, and really, of course, it be, should be obvious that that word disciple is a is a derivative of discipline. 
that you've committed yourself, you've disciplined yourself. In fact, Jesus links that to taking up the cross right. uh, and being a disciple, which means condition, committed, discipline in your walk, in your life. And the church needs people like that. Uh, he did not, this may be offensive to somebody, but um, I've often said if you can be offended, you probably will be. Um, <laughs> But he did not call his disciples to start a country club. Right. He did not call these disciples to to start a, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it. You know, uh, I'm going blank here. Uh, but it wasn't a fellowship group. Right. Um, it, it wasn't a, a fun and activities group. Um, yeah. It wasn't let's have picnics, parties, and... Right. It wasn't that kind of group. It, right. it was a group that he called to be disciples, to be followers, and he called them and then he sent them. Mm -hmm. He sent them. I, I like some of the preaching on Sunday, and I was thinking as Brother Frank was preaching, some people are looking for some kind of calling in their life and they forget yeah. that you've been sent. Right. If you've been sent by Jesus, what yeah. more of a calling do you really need? Right. <laughs> you know? He yeah. sent them. And the purpose of calling disciples and commissioning them and anointing them and them being filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost and, and baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the whole purpose of that is declared throughout the scriptures that they would go out and reach others. Right. That is the purpose of the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our efforts and everything we do should be, should be um, in line with reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't save the church for us all to get together and hang out with each other until Jesus comes. Right. He called us and brought us into this marvelous light so that we could show forth his praise and reach others with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Does that sound, sound about right? Does that sound accurate? Uh, that's what his purpose is. And many people, seek, many people seek the will of God for their life as though it's some mystery that they can never figure out. And it's really simple. The will of God for your life is that you reach people, that you win souls, that you right. you baptize people, that you bring people into the church, that you see people saved. That's that's what it's all about. Yeah. And I will tell you, some of the greatest joys of being in the church is not what we do in forms of fellowship. Some of the greatest joys of being in the church is praying somebody through to the Holy Ghost yeah. or teaching a Bible study and watching somebody come to the Lord and see that person get baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. It's uh, laying hands on somebody and seeing God heal them. Right. Those are the greatest joys of being in the church. Yeah. And we should be praying that God would allow us, help us, and prepare us so that we can be used in that capacity. Amen. Amen. I was yeah. talking to Brother Keith uh, last week. And uh, I was talking about uh, vessels of honor in the house of God. Vessels meet, the Bible says, for the master's use. Ready. Right. That when Jesus reaches for somebody, yeah. when he reaches for a vessel, I need a vessel yeah. that I can pour out. I need a vessel that I can fill up. I need a vessel that I can use for this purpose. When he reaches for the shelf, uh, I want to be the one saying, Lord, let it be me. Yeah. Reach for me. Amen. Amen. And that should be the cry and the desire of every child of God. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Um, let's turn to the book of James chapter 4. We're on the subject of spiritual warfare. And the Lord's been dealing with me throughout this past week. I, I was really going to spend a little bit of time talking about our obvious adversary, the devil, Lucifer. Uh, and we will talk about him. I, I you know, so I don't want to boost his ego and and uh, and everything. Uh, so, devil, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I have somebody more important to talk about tonight than you. Um, but the Lord began to deal with me on this subject of spiritual warfare, and I think it very important uh, and and somewhat even time sensitive. I don't know. I, I just can't put my finger on why. I feel the urgency of sharing what I'm going to share tonight, but, but I feel it. And that should be important enough for you right. to pay attention to what I'm going to say. Yep. Uh, because if I feel it that strongly, there's obviously a reason for it. Uh, if you've been listening and had your ear tuned to the Spirit, uh, if you've been hearing preachers that aren't uh, off their rocker uh, or aren't smoking pot uh, and uh, 
you know, just totally out of their minds, uh, lunatics. If you listen to the preachers that, that are in tune with God and... <laughs> I shouldn't say stuff like that. <laughs> if you're listening to the preachers that are in tune with God or hear from the Spirit, uh, yeah. you're sensing the urgency of the times. Right. Uh -huh. You're sensing the fact right. that the Lord right. could right. come soon. Sure. And it could be sooner than we realize. Uh -huh. uh, but listen, let me just say, be careful who you listen to. Absolutely. Because in times of crisis, it brings all the nuts out of the woodwork. It does. I mean, it, it just brings people with all kind of ideas, and, and they've heard from God. I, 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 I was, I was uh, well, I'm not even going to talk about it. But anyhow, I wasted about 25 minutes of my life. Because <laughs> I try to stay abreast of things, but I wasted about 25 minutes of my life listening to this guy and... It's a shame. I'm just telling you, it's a shame. And it, it makes me mad because people seem to follow these um, strange individuals and their strange doctrines and ideas quicker than they follow truth. And that bothers yeah. me as a yeah. pastor. Right. It bothers me as a minister of the gospel. Um, you know, if it's not based in the Bible, let's not waste our time on it, okay? Right. If it's not based on... Uh, the subject of reaching the lost. Uh, we, we can't uh, allow ourselves to trace every bunny trail uh, of the scriptures and, and doctrine. Uh, we've got to stay with what we know is right and what is true. Amen. So Amen. Uh, keep your focus, church. Keep your focus in these last days. Amen. Uh, because the Lord is speaking, and he does have a church that's a viable force sure. in these times. And uh, we need to be prepared and ready. Meet for the master's use. Amen. James chapter 4. And uh, I'd like to read starting at uh, verse 1. From whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Now, he's not just talking about wars in general or fighting in general. He said, why are there wars and fighting among you? Right. Why are you fighting yourselves? Yeah. Don't they come or come they not hence even of your own lusts? That war in your members? It's a question. Mm -hmm. And I think he's asking the question knowing the answer. The answer is yes. <laughs> don't, they, don't they come from your own lust that war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have. And you cannot obtain. Mm -hmm. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. He's really saying here, some of you don't have what you need simply because you're not asking. Right. Now that that could be a little more uh, expounded upon, like you're not asking the right person, sure. or you're not asking the right God, right. or you're not asking perhaps in the right spirit and attitude. He does clarify a little bit uh, by saying this, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. In other words, you're not asking for those things which you really need. You're not asking for things that are helpful to you in your walk with God. You're not asking for things that, that are really uh, have purpose in your life. And he, he clarifies, you ask because you just want to consume it upon your own lusts. And he likens it unto adultery. You're, you're adulterers and adulteresses. And he's not using that term lightly or even right. loosely. Right. But he's saying that the problem is you're unfaithful to God. Yeah. Watch now. Right. He said, you're adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that the friendship of the world is the enemy. It's enmity with God. Right. Being friends with the world. Again, we talked about this a little bit last week, okay? It's not that we can't be a, a semblance of friendship or connect with people in the world. But when we connect in an inordinate fashion, uh, inordinate times uh, or time frame or time that we spend with people, when we're influenced by the world, when you become a friend of the world, you become an enemy of God. Right. When you become a friend to the things of the world, it's going to have an impact on your life and your relationship with God. Do you think, verse 5, that the scripture saith in vain that the spirit that dwelleth in you lusteth to envy? You have this innate propensity 
to lean toward that which is wrong, and that which is going to please the flesh. It's a it's a uh, uh, an aspect of the fallen nature of mankind. Mm -hmm. And then he says, "But God gives more grace." Yeah. Wherefore he saith, "God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble." What he's doing here in this particular part of this uh, context is he's he's clarifying. It's not the people that are making mistakes in their sincerity in their walk with God. Right. It's the people that are doing what they're doing with a bit of pride. Yeah. So the grace of God is for those in humility that are trying to do what's right, and they just got they got issues and they're trying to work through them. Yeah. They're a work in progress, in other words. Yeah. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Sure. And then he gives us this instruction. If you draw nigh to God, I'm sorry, back up to verse 7. If you submit yourselves, therefore, to God, for these reasons, the reasons that he just described, if, if for these reasons you submit yourself to God, you resist the devil, yeah. and he will flee from you. Notice that's actually two sentences. Sometimes we say, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. No, it, it's a one sentence. Submit yourself to God, period. Yeah. You've, you've, it, it's, nothing's going to go any further until you submit yourself to God. Period. You've right. got to submit yourself to God. The next step is to resist the devil. Right. And he will flee from you. If you're having problems with the devil on your back 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and there's problems in your home and your marriage and your family and every aspect of your life, uh, James gives us a simple solution. Yes. Submit yourself to God. Right. Period. You need to first get down on your face and pray until you feel you have totally surrendered and submitted yourself to God. And then get up from that prayer and resist the devil. Resist the evil influences. Resist what's going on. And it will, it will disappear. It's not like he'll leave you alone forever. Right. But he will leave you alone in that moment. That's why it's a continual thing that we do. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Some of our problems could be solved if we just listened to the scriptures. Right. And did what it said. Yeah. Good point. And then he says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Yes. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Uh, let me just read the next two verses, because he says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. We don't like to hear that, right? No, we want to hear laughter and rejoicing and joy. But he said, no, it, it, when it comes to this, when you're having problems... Yeah. When you're losing the battle, you need to be afflicted. You need to mourn and you need to weep. And let your laughter be turned to mourning. And let your joy be turned to heaviness. And if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, He shall lift you up. Amen. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about the enemy of self. The enemy of self. I mentioned this, I believe, last week. And contrary to what we might think, our biggest enemy really isn't the devil. Mm -hmm. He's a defeated foe. Right. He's done. His fate is sealed. He knows his end. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's trying harder and harder as the time gets shorter and shorter. It's why hell is enlarging herself, as the Bible says. It's why uh, the world is getting worse and worse. Because the devil knows as we approach the coming of the Lord. And, and he, he doesn't know either when the Lord's coming, right. as well as us. We, do, we don't know either. Uh, but he can sense probably more than even some people the uh, urgency of the hour. And so we see evil encroaching more and more into every aspect of daily life and his influence in everything that's going on. Yet that's still not our biggest enemy. Right. Because, you know, we shout, we love to shout and run the aisles when we hear scriptures like, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. It sounds great on a Sunday when, the, when the, the music's jumping and pumping and everybody's running the aisles and shouting and speaking in tongues. But on a Tuesday afternoon, when, when all hell breaks loose on the job and everything's falling apart, yeah. uh, you need more than, than just hearing that scripture that greater is he that is in me. Right. Uh, you need something inside you. Right, yeah. That gives you an inner strength that comes from God to help you fight in that moment. Because the biggest enemy we face is our mortal flesh. Right. I talked a little bit about it last time. 
I talked a little bit about Adam and Eve, and especially Eve. She was deceived out, the Bible says. Yeah. She was deceived out. At the point at which she took the fruit and put it in her mouth and began to eat it, she had, she had been deceived out of the garden. She was gone right. from Eden. She had sealed her fate yeah. by disobedience. Right. <laughs> Adam, and I believe being a type of Christ, when he saw the plight of his one and only, yeah. as should any man, accepted the fate of his wife and willingly partook of the fruit. And we know how the chain uh, goes when God questions them. What have you, why, how do you know you're naked? How did this come to be? And Adam says, well, the, it was the woman you gave me. Yeah. And, and he looks at Eve and says, and she, well, the serpent deceived me. And, you know, the devil just smiles because it worked. Yeah. It worked. It worked in Eden and it's still working today. Right. Lust of the eye. Lust of the flesh, pride of life. Yep. Do you know what it all comes down to? Self. Mm. Yep. You see, what, what the devil was doing at Eden is exactly what he does from now until the Lord comes. And now until this world is over. Until it's, he appeals to your ego, yep. to the lust of your flesh. And he appealed enough to Eve to get her to, to disobey the commandment of God. And that's all that has to happen today. Mm. A picture in a magazine. Sure. A scene in a movie. Yeah. A beat in a song. Right. A look, a glance, a temptation. Sure. And let me just say for somebody who might be misguided... God doesn't tempt you. And He doesn't put temptations right, right, in your right. way. Right. And no, He didn't create you with those desires. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's a nice excuse. And it sounds good among your friends that you're drinking with. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not true. God did not put any of those desires in you. Right. What happened was the devil appealed to the flesh of mankind in the garden. And that still happens today. This flesh that we possess... This human nature. David said it this way, In sin did my mother conceive me. Some felt like David was some kind of illegitimate child, and he was not. What he meant was conception. When, when you're conceived, uh, some, some people call it a sin gene. I don't know if I'd go that far, but, but there's obviously a, uh, a genetic predisposition sure. to sin. That probably sounded just like what I said. I didn't think it was. But, <laughs> but the point is, it's there. We, we're born into a world. Right. We're conceived in a world, born into a world that is full of sin. It's very evident even with children. Nobody sits down. Well, I, I've wondered at times if people sit down and teach their kids to lie. Uh, but most people don't sit down and teach their kids. Now, I'm going to tell you how to lie. But that child, when they get a certain age. Yeah. Did you break that dish? No. <laughs> and you know there was nobody else in the house. Right. You know it didn't fall. And the, the, you know, parents ask questions like the, these these questions parents say, Well, do you think it fell off itself? <laughs> and child's like, I wish I would have thought of that first. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's it the the term is innate propensity. It's kind of already in you. Yeah. And we need to be aware of that fact. Because our greatest enemy is our flesh. Yeah. And selfishness is a sign of the end time. It's mentioned by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In fact, it's the first thing he mentions as a sign of the end time. Yeah. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 he says, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. That, that'll preach right there, man, right now. <laughs> We're in perilous times. Watch, but the first thing he says is, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Right. I'm telling you right now, just, just listen, you can mark this down. This is truth. This is gospel. The greatest contribution and the biggest reason the world is in the condition it's in right now yeah. is that right there. Absolutely. Men are lovers right. of their own selves, of their own flesh, with their own desires. Hello. 
Right. It says in another place, lovers of pleasure right. more than lovers of God. Yeah. Right? Right? He goes on to say covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy. But the first thing he says is, men are going to love themselves. Right. right. Now, it's interesting, okay, because when Jesus talks about being a disciple, he says this. It, it becomes the, the uh, most important requirement and the first thing Jesus asks of disciples if you're going to follow me, in fact, there's a harmony of three gospel accounts, Matthew 16, 24, Mark 8, 34, and Luke 9, 23, where Jesus says this phrase or these words, if any man will come after me, right. let him deny himself yeah. and take up his cross and follow me. Right. Luke actually slips in daily, which I don't think he just threw in for his own good measure, but I think that was the, he understood the implication was if you're going to follow Jesus, it can't be a Sunday only situation. Right. If you're going to follow Jesus and be a disciple, it can't just be when you're coming to church. Right. If you're going to live for God and be holy, it can't be just something that you do when other people are watching. Right. He said, you've got to, you've got to deny yourself, yeah. take up your cross and follow me. Right. Now, that phrase is mentioned by Jesus as a requirement of discipleship. Now, many people, while initially correct, limit Jesus' command, deny yourself, to simply mean this. Well, you've got to lay down your will and do the will of God. And that, that's true. That is true. He's saying you're you got to lay down what you want in your will and do the will of God. But if you think about this in the context of selflessness right. versus selfishness, yeah. Yeah. what Jesus is really saying is you've got to commit yourself to living a selfless life. Right. You've got to commit yourself to living... You, you cannot be selfish and be a disciple. Right. You can't think of yourself and be pleasing to God. Right. If you're going to be a disciple, then you've got to pick up your cross yeah. and daily deny yourself or become a selfless individual. In fact, the word deny from the original Greek means to forget oneself. Right. How many people have said that or heard people say that? You know, they, somebody upsets them, they go, well, forget you. <laughs> Maybe that's what you need to do is look in the mirror and say, forget you, pal. <laughs> it means to lose sight of oneself. Yeah. Listen to me, folks. We need to become so committed to God that we lose sight of our own desires. Sure. We lose sight of our selfish tendencies. It also means... To lose sight of one's own interests. Hmm. If you talk to somebody, you meet up with them and start talking to them in a very short period of time, sometimes within a minute to three minutes, you'll find out what's most important to that person. Right. They'll whip out their wallet and show you pictures of their grandchildren. Sure. Um, they'll, they'll talk about their car. <laughs> um, they'll talk about their favorite thing to do, their hobby or their interests. Sure. Um, very quickly, they'll tell you what's most important to them. What Jesus is saying is, you've got to live a life that is so committed to me that in the first three minutes of conversation, you start telling people about me and what I've done in your life. Deny. It kind of gives you a different perspective on denying yourself, right? If any man, Jesus could have said it this way, if any man's going to be a disciple... He needs to become selfless yeah. and pick up his cross mm -hmm. and follow me. Selfless. Right. I will tell you that selfishness has reached epic levels in our day. Mm -hmm. Everything, the advertisements for products, the, 
You name it. Everything is geared toward you, you, you. It's all about you. That's what everybody wants you to... They're selling stuff. They want to appease. And listen, listen, listen. It's the same... It's the same uh, modus operandi of the devil. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it look good? Yeah. Don't you think it will make you feel good? Right. Don't you think it will empower you? How, how much of what we hear today is about empowerment? Right. Empowerment. Yeah. And about doing, having fun, mm -hmm. enjoying. You know, everything is about how much you'll enjoy this. I, 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 I've been so irritated yet somewhat humored and, and then angered <laughs> by the advertisements that that uh, that glamorize things that destroy people's lives alcohol cigarette smoking vaping all these things destroying and, and you know what Pe preachers have preached against these things for years uh, uh, when vaping came along I, I, I preached about that you know, and people, I mean, people say, you know, well, it, it's, it's no, it doesn't have nicotine in it, doesn't have that. I, want, I asked one person, I said, what, pick up that container and look, read what's in it. Yep. And it started, it's stuff I couldn't even pronounce. Yep. You know, uh, where did it come from? They said, it's come from China. <laughs> That's all I needed to hear. You know? I said, seriously. Right. We preach about this stuff and then preachers get a bad rap, mm -hmm. you know. Because we're telling people how to live their lives and what to do. But, but, but listen, folks, all of that stuff is about pleasing your flesh. I, I've told our leadership, and I preach from this pulpit to people in our church, to you folks, you've heard me say it. We need to be careful how much time and how much money we spend on pleasing our flesh. Right. Yeah. Pleasures. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Paul said, from such, turn away. Right. Don't even, you, don't fellowship with people like that. Yes. That's, that's pretty hard. You think, I, you think I'm a tough pastor? <laughs> Paul said, you, people that are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, yeah. turn away from them. them people that are like this, men that are lovers of their own selves, he goes down this list to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn away, get, right. just don't. It's, he's not saying don't associate with them, don't try to reach them with the gospel, don't witness to them, don't teach them. He's not saying any of that. Right. He's just saying if you're going to hang out with people, try not to hang out with people like that. And, and if it sounds like I'm coming down on things, I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to help you understand that your, your biggest enemy is yourself. Right. The enemy of self is the thing we've got to fight more than anything else. And, and I've got some scriptures I want to share with you, and hopefully it will help you tonight. I even have... I even have the top pastor's look questions to ask yourself to see if you're selfish. I'm going to share that with you before I'm done. I'm not going to go over these, but if you read Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about the battle between the spirit and the flesh. And it's in this text. I believe I referenced this last Wednesday when I was teaching. But Romans 7.21 is where he says, I find that a wall. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. Mm -hmm. Now, what Paul wasn't saying, I got demons in me and the Holy Ghost in me. Right. People have asked that question, you know. <laughs> if, you got, if you're full of a Holy Ghost, you can't have devils in you. It just doesn't work that way. They don't get along. They don't get along, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't cohabitate well. <laughs> in fact, the power of God and the power of the Holy Ghost will, will vacate the devils. Right. A friend of mine just recently uh, shared a testimony about a lady who came into the church, and uh, they, they prayed. It was almost like one of those times in the Bible uh, where they prayed several times, and it got down to it that he knew there was, there was still one, one spirit that was in her. And he spoke specifically to that spirit, and finally that spirit came out. And then she, she was filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. So that, see what I'm saying? The devil's got to go before the Holy Ghost can come in. Or the Holy Ghost will come in and push the devils out. But, but it's not going to happen, okay? So Paul's not saying, I got the devil in me and, you know. And he, he's not really even saying, I got the devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other. You know, it's kind of made in cartoons and stuff like that. What he's saying is, my flesh. He's talking about the battle between spirit and flesh. The Holy Ghost is in me. But my flesh still has this, yeah. I've got to fight this desire that is in me. So he, he mentions this. 
He, he talks in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 about self-control. In fact, he goes beyond that and says this, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Some commentaries say he literally is saying, I beat myself down. <laughs> right. Lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Right. Uh, for those of you who believe that once you're saved, you're always saved, uh, Paul himself says, I've got to work on this. Right. He's the one who said you've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's the one who mentions many times about the prospect of being lost right. and, and those who were lost and those that he turned over to Satan uh, that they may learn or be, be taught. Uh, and in this case, he says, I, I battle my flesh and I bring it under subjection that, that you know, having preached to others in my status in the kingdom of God, that I would lose out and become a castaway. Right. He recognizes. Listen, the battle that you're fighting with yourself is a battle. You've got to allow the Spirit of God to help you win because you will destroy yourself. Right. And you'll blame it on everybody else along the way. I don't know how many times I've seen people. It frustrates me as a pastor. And I'll be honest with you, it just frustrates me. It's self-destruction. There's selfish tendencies and selfish ways. Sometimes I'm hearing people talk, and all I'm thinking while they're telling me something is this. You're just selfish, man. You're just selfish, lady. That's, that's what, sister, you're selfish. That's why you're saying this. Because you're not thinking about anybody else. All you're thinking about is yourself. Yeah. And listen, we, we've got to battle that. Way back in the Garden of Eden, the devil tried it. He, I'm just going to try this. I'm going to test this human being that God created, this perfect individual that God created. I'm going to test her and see. And he tested her. Look at that fruit. Don't you think it would taste good? It's better than any fruit. You never ate this fruit. I went through that last week. I'm not going through it again. If you eat it, the reason God doesn't want you to eat it is because it's going to make you like him. Right. And the devil knew that's what got him kicked out of heaven. Right. So look, if I, if I can get her to think that she can be like God, he'll kick her out too. And it worked. Yeah. And, and so anything... That comes to you that makes you start thinking, well, I deserve that. Yeah. Well, I want that. Right. Well, I'd like to have that. Mm -hmm. You better be careful. Listen, you need mm -hmm. to recognize. Come on. That's what Paul's saying. I recognize the things that are in me that could destroy me, and I beat them down. Yeah. I, I beat them down. I surrender. I submit myself to God and become selfless. I will tell you this, my friend. If you lean yourself and lend yourself and give yourself to selflessness, yeah. you will find your, yourself more satisfied, more happy, more, more pleased to be living in this life. Sure. You'll find the simple things mean more than anything else you could ever have. Right. right, right, right. I, I'm hearing somebody say amen right now. I hear it in the Holy Ghost. And I hear some people saying, oh me. And some people saying, oh my. And some people, all of a sudden, you had to go to the bathroom <laughs> or go get a drink, a soda. The Apostle Paul, when he talks about true love, I had to clarify that. When he talks about true love in 1 Corinthians 13, he says what love is not. Right. I think it's important, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, here I go. They write songs about it, you know. I want to know what love is. I want to know what love is. Maybe it'd be better if we found out what love is not. Sometimes it helps us to understand something more when we realize what it not is than we find out what it is, right? Hallelujah. So, <laughs> I don't know what I said there, but anyhow... Let's go back to the words of the scripture of the Apostle Paul. Can't go wrong there, right? Charity suffereth long. Charity is long-suffering. Yes. It is kind. What it does not do is envy. Right. Charity envieth not. Love right. is not envious. Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look at what somebody else has and says, I wish I had that. Mm -hmm. No. It doesn't look at, well... It, you know, I, I think about among our preaching here. I, I think we have a great round of preaching. We get this, but you know, one of our one of our preachers here might say, you know, well, bless God, he gets to preach more than I do. 
that's a, that's that could let, open yourself to envy. Sure. Mm-hmm. Envy, like he he's and, and who's who's being served when you become envy? Mm-hmm. Right. All you're thinking about yourself. Yeah. You know. And by the way, if you guys feel like why you're not preaching more, come and ask me. You know? <laughs> Everybody's happy, I think, anyhow. So, Amen. Charity vaunteth not itself. In other words, it doesn't brag on itself. Right. When you have to, when you have to praise yourself for your accomplishments, yep. who is getting the glory? Mm-hmm. You are, right? It's a right. selfish act. When you have to point out your own achievements and abilities. The, the Psalms and the Proverbs are good at giving us advice on that. Let another man praise you. A stranger and not your own lips. Right. Doesn't it sound a whole lot better when somebody else brags on you than when you brag on yourself? Well, especially love. Love doesn't do that. Love is not puffed up. Right. Love is not puffed up. It's not proud. It, is, it does not behave itself unseemly. Right. In other words, it doesn't act out of character or out of, uh, out of line. Not at all. And watch this. Love seeketh not her own. It doesn't love. True love is not looking for what pleases me. Mm-hmm. True love is going to be what pleases God and what pleases those around me. Love is not easily provoked and it thinks no evil. Right. So, I want to I want to admonish you right now. If your thoughts gravitate to yourself and what pleases you and what makes you happy, you know, there's this old uh, saying uh, among men with their wives it, and, and children in the family, if mommy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. As a woman, I don't, I don't know that I'd be, um, I'd be flattered by that comment. Because what that saying is, if, ladies, if you're not happy, yeah. what it's saying is, ladies, it's all about you. And if you're not happy, nobody else is going to be happy. It's not really a flattering statement, okay? Think about yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself some hard-to-ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, it starts starts with your relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about that agape love, a godly love, a pure love. It's not just admonitions to husbands and wives on their wedding day. It's really about godly love. Godly love. And, and he closes, now abide in faith, hope, and love, charity. Right. These three, faith, hope, and love. He said the greatest of these is love. If you've got love, what he's saying throughout the whole chapter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, what he's saying is if you've got love, you've got everything. Not just love, like the songs, the worldly songs say, but love of God, if you've got the love of God in your life, and so it really starts with with your love for God, right? When when they ask Jesus, "What is the greatest commandment of all?" Mm-hmm. and His response was this: the Shema, right. Deuteronomy six and four, that you love God. And Jesus, uh, one of the gospel writers says, Jesus said, "With your heart, mind, soul, and strength." Mm-hmm. That's with every ounce of your being. In other words. You, you really love God. Listen, I, I don't know if this is just my own thought process or just my own commentary or my own feeling or my own opinion. But, but it kind of makes me feel like this. What he's saying is you've got to love God with everything that is within you. So that with, when you love God that way, there's nothing left in you. Right. So the love that you have for others then, because he does say the second commandment, he just, well, let's throw this out here for good measure. The second commandment is like unto it, and, and it's that you love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so Jesus is saying, look, you got to love God until, th- there's an old song that says that, I want to love until there's no yeah. more love. I wanna, in other words, I'm going to love God with everything i got. And then the love that I have for everybody else is going to come from the love that God gives back 
to me. Right. My Lord. Amen. I mean, I just feel like I just feel like that's how it works. When we give him everything, when we direct all of our praise and all of our worship and all of our love toward God, coming back from the Lord through the Holy Ghost is a love. And then it, it comes out. Somebody said, well, I believe it was Brother Libby, uh, Ron Libby, and, and my good friend that said this the first time I heard it was, if your if your uh, horrors, if your uh, vertical relationship is right, if your relationship with God is right, all of those horizontal relationships with people in this world will be right. Because if you get that one right, everything else falls into place. And I believe that's so true, that we love God with it. Jesus is saying, you've got to put your, you, you've got to take a back seat. You've got to take the last row. Right. You've got to take last place. You can't be the one who's got to have it your way and do it your way. And it's, it's you know, you've got to lay down that selfish desire and say, Lord, I want you to reign in my life. Amen. God will never reign in your life if you're the one that's always sitting on the throne of your heart. Yep. You've, got to, you've got to vacate that position of control mm -hmm. and, and power of your life and say, God, I want you to reign in me. Selfless desire. The Apostle Paul points this out in in Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. He says, Look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, don't just take care of yourself. Right. Yeah. You know, the famous line of Cain about his brother Abel, whom he had murdered, to God, he says, am I my brother's keeper? And the, the truth of the matter is, yes. Right. It does say to bear one another's burdens. Sure. To help one another. Just look up one another in the Bible. There's so many scriptures that use the term one another. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 24, Paul says this, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Right. In other words, don't seek to make yourself rich and make yourself fill your bank account. Try to help somebody else do good. Sure. Well, that's a novel idea, right? <laughs> Let's read on to Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What it's saying is this. Jesus the man recognized that there was power from the Almighty God. He called him his father. Yeah. Right. He recognized that in him dwelt a power and an authority. And he understood that that only came because of the power of God in him. That's what Paul meant when he said he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He knew that everything that happened, many times he confessed, I don't do it of myself. I'm not doing what I want to do. I do what my Father tells me. I say what my Father... Come on, how many of us can say that we live our lives and we do what God tells us to do? And we say what God tells us to say? And we inquire of the Lord, especially for all those major decisions in our life. We say, God, what do you want me to do? Yeah. It's interesting because I know people that were afraid to pray and ask God to have his way right. because they knew what they wanted to do is not what God wanted them to do. Right. I know people that come to me as a pastor and say, I would come and ask you, but I already knew what you would say. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and ultimately what they're confessing is they knew what they were doing or planning to do or what they were doing at the time was wrong. Right. And so they didn't want to inquire some sound advice. And we do this sometimes. Listen, Jesus himself, the Son of God, in and dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2 and 9 says. He recognized this. The devil appealed to this, even in his temptation. It's interesting, right? Turn the stones to bread, lust of the flesh. Right. I'll give you the kingdoms of the world, lust of the eye. Throw yourself off the temple. The angels will come pick you up because the Word of God says they would do that. Pride of life. The same temptations 
that we face every day. Jesus himself faced. And he faced them after 40 days of fasting with power and authority. I like what somebody said one time. That, that the devil came to Jesus in his weakest moment. And Jesus still defeated him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah. That doesn't mean, what I should say, what that means to us is, even in our weakest moment, we can defeat the devil. And it starts by defeating our flesh. Right. Jesus understood. How was it that he was able to know and possess the knowledge and understanding that the power of God was in him, and yet he humbled himself and became obedient to the death on the cross? Right. Because he understood he wasn't in this world for him. Right. He was in this world. For the purpose of God. Amen. Wow. Think about that for a minute. Yes. I'm in this world for the purpose of God. Hmm. James. James makes it very clear. I'm trying to put on the landing gear and try to land this thing here in a couple minutes. He said, you're, you're, you're fighting the wrong enemy. You're fighting the wrong enemy. Because... The problem is you, you haven't defeated yourself. Right. And so you're, you're going to look at other people in the church. You're going to get jealous or you're going to get envious or you're, you're going to get upset. You're going to get mad at the pastor. You, you're going to, because you really haven't defeated your own flesh. Mm -hmm. Preaching is going to come at you and it's going to offend you. And you're going to think the pastor is just talking about you and and trying to subliminally let everybody know your problems and what you're doing in your life. Right. I have not, nor will I ever, use this pulpit as a means or a method to get at people or to um, subliminally say things or do things. You know, if I've got something to say, I'll come right to you and say it. I don't have a problem with that. Right. But, but when we're not winning the battle with flesh, we're going to blame everybody else for our loss. We're going to recognize, a child of God, listen, it's impossible for you to get baptized in Jesus' name, have your sins washed away, be filled with the Holy Ghost, and live for God for any number of days, weeks, or years, and not recognize when you don't possess the same power that you once possessed. Right. You know it. Yeah. And you, you know what we do? Instead of admitting that we're not praying like we should... That we're not living for God like we should. That we slacked off and we let up. Instead of admitting that we're letting our flesh win. And I'm talking to somebody right now. Alright? And you need to hear this. Because the, the, the enemy of self is your greatest enemy. And when you're, when you're not prayed up, prayed through, powered up, full of the Holy Ghost. You recognize it. You know what's going on. You know. Listen, and if there's a point in your life that you can look back and say... I was, more, I was more full of the Holy Ghost and had more power with God back then in whatever year, week, or month, or however long it was. Right. Friend, you better, you better do a Jacob and get back to Bethel, honey. Yeah. <laughs> you better get back to Bethel and pray through. You better get back to Bethel and see some angels going up and down a staircase. Yeah. 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 You better get back to Bethel and get a hold of God and wrestle with Him all night long. Until he, he touches your thigh and you walk with a limp the rest of your life. <laughs> not, not literally, but you know what I'm saying. Right. You need to get back to that place. There's, there's an old song about getting back to the basics of life. There's a song Andre Couch used to sing, Take me back. Take me right. back, dear Lord. And some people think that's, that's ridiculous. Well, I don't want to go back to where I want. Listen, it's a biblical thing. Sure. It's a biblical thing. God told Jacob. You know what, Jacob? You're out of line you got problems, and what you need to do is get back to Bethel. That's what you need to do. You need right. to go back to a place where you knew you got a hold of me. Right. That's why some of y'all need to get, you know, I know we're going to open the doors here and come back to church, but you need to get back to God. You need to get back to church. Right. You need to get back in the house of God. I, I would to God that when we come back in this building on February 7th, that there's some people here we haven't seen in a long time. If you're hearing me right now, I'm telling you, you need to get back to the house of God. Right. I pray that when we come back to this place, not that we just shout and run the aisles and rejoice that we're back in church, but we run to these altars and fall on the floor, and then we will have to replace the carpet because it's full of snot and tears. Sure. And no, no uh, wet vac is going to get it up, and no carpet cleaner is going to clean it. That wouldn't offend me at all if we have to replace the carpet in the front every other Sunday. 
because it's messed up with snot and tears and people bawling and, and makeup running on the floor and everything else, man. Come on, it's time for us to repent and do the first works. Uh -huh. That's what God told Ephesus in the book of Revelation when he's talking to the seven churches. Right. He said, you've left your first love. Right. You've left your first love. You, you didn't lose it. You, didn't, right. you, you left it. You walked away from it. He said, you need to repent and come back and do the first works. And James said, you've got a battle going on. And if you don't fight, if you don't fight your flesh, you're going to lose. And you're going to lose out with God. And you're going to blame everybody else for it. Right. I know what I'm talking about. I've been in this a long time. I've dealt with a lot of people. I've tried to help people. And, and everybody that gets in that place, I can tell when they're in that spot. When they start blaming everybody else. Sure. You need to sing some of those old songs again, right? Bishop Secrets, you sing that song. He loved it. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, <laughs> standing in the need of prayer. Right. You need to get back to an Isaiah experience where he was pointing his fingers at everybody else. There's seven woes in the book of Isaiah. Uh, chapter 5 and 6, actually through 3 to 5, I think it is, 3 to 6. And Isaiah's pointing out, woe is this, woe is this, woe is this. And then he sees the Lord high and lifted up and his train fills the temple. And the place is filled with smoke and he sees the angels flying back and forth. And then he says, woe is me. Yeah. What Isaiah realizes, is, you know what? I'm the one that's had the problem all along. Right. My, my, my. We're so quick to point our finger at somebody else. And we don't realize how much we're responsible for what's going on in our own life. Yeah. Wow. I, you weren't expecting this, right? Neither was I. <laughs> I was going to talk about the devil. Everybody would have been happy. Yes. <laughs> the devil. Blame it on the death straight pastor. It's the devil's fault. Most of the times it's really not. For, first of all, the devil is not omnipresent. Right. Okay? He, he, he is an angel that if he's, if he's out in California... <laughs> I'm going to hate myself. <laughs> My brothers and sisters in California, Brother Art Hodges, I love you, Brother Hodges. Thank you for the fight. Uh, I feel like the devil's been spending a lot of time out there. And uh, we need to defeat that. Amen. We need to defeat that spirit and that attitude. Um, but if the devil's in California, he's not in Pennsylvania. Right. And if he's at 2937 Adams Drive, uh, he's not in Shippensburg, Fayetteville, or wherever else. You know? He's not omnipresent. Right. I realize there's demonic forces and evil and blah, blah, blah and everything else. But really, that, that's really usually not the problem. The problem is real. Listen, if God said, if God said, I will give you power over all the power of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'll tread on serpents and scorpions. Nothing deadly will harm you. Right. Well, what's our excuse then, really? He, he kind of took every excuse we have away yeah. about the devil and the enemy and the forces of hell. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Right. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. They're taking out strongholds. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not winning the battle. Mm -hmm. Not because of those enemies. Mm -hmm. So the enemy we see <clears throat> when we get dressed and look in the mirror in the morning and get ready to start our day. Tomorrow morning, when you get up and get yourself ready for the day, and you look in the mirror, <laughs> I said this last week, you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, you're going down. <laughs> down on the altar. Down in prayer. Right. Because the Lord is going to reign in this life. Is anybody with me? Amen. I got some questions for you. I'm going to fire these to you, and maybe we'll have them, maybe I'll have my wife push them out to you, because It'll be hard for you to write them down. But if you just listen real quickly, I, I end with this tonight. These are questions. I wrote these. These are my own. My own questions on questions to determine your level of selfishness. All right? Number one, do you listen with the intent to understand or with the intent to respond? When somebody's talking. Are you listening with the intent to understand what they're saying or are you already calculating what you're going to say? Yeah. Do you always have to have the last word? Do you feel that you are always right or right most of the time? <laughs> are you open to the opinions of others? 
Do you put the needs of others before your own? Do you try to make people feel guilty for not doing enough for you? Do you find it difficult to do something that doesn't bring you satisfaction? Do you spend more time doing what you want over that which those who are close to you want to do? Do you have to have a required amount of me time? <laughs> and finally, do you have a hard time praying that God's will be done in any aspect of your life? Mm. I saved that one for last. Do you have a hard time saying, God, let your will be done? Is there any part of your life where you can't say job, family, whatever? God, let your will be done. Test your measure of selfishness against your level, level of selflessness. Amen. Because the voice you hear is going to win the fight. Amen. God bless you. I'll be back with more later. <laughs> on this subject and more. <laughs> Amen. Thank praise you. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Such a wonderful message from our pastor this evening. Just, it, it's something really to get you to think, you know. I was talking to my mother a couple of days ago about this topic, and it, it's really easy to point fingers at, you know, other people or point fingers at, you know, somebody labeled as, the enemy, but not often do we look in the mirror and say, hey, it's you, you know. Uh, Pastor did such a wonderful job um, just letting us know that sometimes, well, a lot of the time, we need to really take some time to get this flesh under control. And that, that brought to my attention this passage of Scripture that I really want to take time to read to you all. It's in Galatians chapter 5. And this is what it says. Paul is talking to the church here, and he says, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would want to do, that you would do. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. And he continues, he says that there, there are consequences when the flesh is just, when you let it run loose. It begins to manifest in all of these different ways. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. And he, he continues to say in such like, because there, there's so many ways that this flesh can manifest itself if you just let it run wild. And he says, I told you before, if you just, if you let this stuff run wild, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And, and the question is, well, that's great. How do you, how do you fix that? He started off this, he started off this thought like this. And this is the answer that pastor was nailing so hard tonight such a wonderful job. He said, for brethren, you are called unto liberty. And don't just use liberty for one occasion to the flesh, but love one another. And this I say then, walk in the spirit mm -hmm. and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. Such, such a wonderful and timely message Amen. this evening. If you're encountering any of the manifestations of the flesh, I, I just admonish you. I, I, ch I challenge you even Take a moment to look at where you are in life and say, you know what, God, I'm going to start walking in the spirit. I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to be a disciple. Would you join with me in a time of prayer as we close? Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for giving us another opportunity to hear your word. I thank you, God, for giving me the chance to realize, Lord, that I may very well be the thing keeping you from what you want to do, Lord. I pray, God, that you would help us realize when we're the ones standing in the way of having your will be done in our lives, Lord. And I pray that you would be with us and walk with us, God. And wherever we are, Lord, let your spirit enter into that place, Lord, and let us get rid of this flesh. Let us crucify this flesh, Lord, and walk in faithfulness and committedness to you, God. And let us give you everything Jesus. that we have every single day, Lord, so that Hallelujah. this flesh is not our enemy, Lord. We need you, Jesus. Lord, we need Thank you every you, step Lord. of the way, Lord. Let us be your disciples. Let us be the ones who are disciplined that you can trust Jesus. in God. In Jesus' name, we're going to see you all Sunday again. If
if you're having any of these issues, Pastor did such a wonderful job. I challenge you, just listen to this another time and walk in the Spirit. See you all Sunday. Amen.